How many know that this is really an ugly looking God? Okay. This is just an envelope. But this is, this again, I'm teaching you to remember this every morning when you get up. First of all, you're not sitting just in the pew. The Bible says, here you are. You're a jewel in God's eyes. Isn't that nice? You are a ruby of God. But the Bible says, if any man be in Christ. So we're in Christ. So this beautiful ruby is now going to be deposited in something more beautiful. The Lord. Amen. Now, you're not out in the elements. But you're in God. And God is out in front of you, right? But it doesn't stop there. It says, you're in Christ in God. So, how does the devil know you're in there? Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> because we open our big flat mouth and say things contrary, listen, to the word. And when we start talking contrary to the word, Satan knows it's not God that you're in. He knows that you are hoping that God's surrounding you. Well, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. new. Amen. All right, here's another illustration. I hope we're getting this on the camera. All right. This is you. Coca-Cola, a little Coca-Cola glass, okay. But you, you're far more beautiful. You are a container, a vessel. Say, I'm a container, and I'm a vessel. God wants me filled with him and not the world. So when we were sinners, we kind of looked like this. I'm not going to say what comes to my mind, because not everything that comes to my mind is of God. We're tainted, because Adam sinned, and he passed through our gene structure the sin that kills us and sentences us to hell. It's tainted our spirit so we don't look whole. But then we decided we needed Jesus. So we asked Jesus to come into our life and forgive us. And he starts pouring that new life. Oh, that new life feels so good. Amen. Woo. And suddenly our spirit becomes clean. Amen. But every once in a while... The enemy seems to come by and you get into all the little gossip, little unforgiveness, and you start to turn brown. <laughs> Amen. You don't want to turn brown. So that's why we meet with God every day and we ask him to cleanse us and we have a face-to-face -face relationship. So we're in the condition that when we pray for others, our prayers are not hindered. Can you say amen? All right. So we just go to God and he just keeps cleansing us. He never stops. He just keeps cleansing us and cleansing us. The Bible says, be not filled with wine where in excess, but be as being filled with the Spirit, speaking yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. See, it doesn't matter what kind of gunk the, the enemy tries to drop into our head or our system. As we stay with God, he continually washes that out. He doesn't hold our faults against us. He washed, constantly washes. So the trick is, if I have to use that term, the key is for me to get you to meet with God so he can do the operations and what, give you what you need and constantly get you to flow. Now, what does the Bible say about the water? We are washed by the water of the word. So as the word comes out, you're being washed in a sermon. Don't miss church. Get washed all the time. It's like taking an extra shower. Amen. Not only that, but Jesus said when he went to the well, if you drink of this water, you will thirst again. See, okay, so we walk through the day. And as we walk through the day, people pull on us and the job situation pull on us. A little bit more seems to drain. And now we're a little empty. This empty spot is what Satan likes. So we don't stay empty. We to go back and we get... Filled. Can you say amen? And you want to have enough where everybody's got plenty that gets next to you. It keeps coming off you. 
water and the washing. And can you say amen? So that's what happens. So don't go a day without prayer. Don't go a day without some consulting of the word. Why? Because it helps right us. Any good carpenter will tell you, unless it's balanced, unless it's in plumb, unless it's at right angles, you're not going to build a very square house. Hello. And without a good foundation under your, your feet, you're not going to be very stable for very long. Remember, it says that those on the wayside is when hear the word, they receive it with gladness. This is a parable of the sower. But immediately Satan comes to steal the word that's sown in their heart. So new people, when they come to church, you know, and let's say they give their hearts to the Lord, we need to keep them in prayer so that they're constantly being changed and Satan doesn't pluck them out. Look at your neighbor and say, you're anti-plucked up. <laughs> I know, I threw it up. What does that mean? That means you're, God's, nobody can pluck you out of God's hands. It says that in John 10. No one could pluck you out of God's hands. Well, can we lose our salvation if you really work hard at it? Why would you want to do something like that? You see, the whole thought is just a thought, a reasoning. But yet, you think about it, and God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only begotten son, so he thinks you're that valuable. All right. How many here remember the old puck? Huh? <laughs> Got to make sure how I say that. <sighs> you get into the presence of God, and you start soaking up. Oh, the juicy, free. Now you're able to clean and work. I'm not going to put it on your face. It was a temptation, but I'm not going to. It's a very temp. It's a good temp. I sure love you, Seth. You know, it's one of those things. Amen. And what has happened? We turned into the superheroes, you know? Which don't, let, don't let the world press you down and make you hard. Don't let your, don't become crabby. When we get older, we're supposed to be sweeter. Sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Amen? All right, so this is the new creation realities. This is number four. And it's actually, the subtitle of it is Vessels of Power. So we're a container, as you can see by my illustration. We contain things, don't we? Amen. Some of us contain complaints. Some of us contain uh, good things and bad things. Some of us contain nothing but good. You follow what I'm saying? We are made to contain something. We are made to carry something. We're made to be vessels of honor. Well, the two things I want you to contemplate before we actually get started today is that I want to ask you this question. How, where does the devil get his power? Think about it before you shout it. I know some people know because I taught this a lot, but where does the devil actually get his power? Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 28, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. You go therefore in my name. So if he was given all power, where's the devil getting his? First of all, we have to define the word power. Jesus stripped Satan of all miracle power and spiritual power, okay? The only ability or power that Satan has, and I kind of, is his ability to deceive us out of our authority. So Satan gets his power from you and I when we don't understand scripture. We often say the wrong things. We often sometimes wonder if we're really fit to serve the Lord, all these crazy stuff. He feeds off of that. So he gets his power from the church because we, through ignorance or sin or honoriness, whatever, we give him that ammunition because Jesus, didn't he strip the devil? Made a show of him publicly triumphing over them in it. So Satan is stripped, but he comes to us with the power of deception. So if any power that he has, he has deception. Now, what feeds the devil? 
The devil gets his power from deception, but what feeds the energy for him to do the things that he does? Jesus stripped him. You need to know these answers, by the way. Division. Getting people to be against one another. Have you ever seen on Friday night at the ball game and two different people loving two different teams? How they get a little juiced and stand up. Next thing you know, they're fighting over something as dumb as who their favorite team is. Now, who do you think is behind that? Why is there rumors of wars and wars? Because Satan gets in and turns one against another. As Christians, we are not to think more highly than we have to think of ourselves, but to think humbly, esteeming others greater than ourselves. Why? This cuts the power of Satan creating division. He'll get you mad at something. It doesn't even have to be another person. And that energy of being angry, he feeds off it like a vampire. So in our prayer closet, when we meet with God every day, you ask God to turn you into a lover, into a, a person that walks in grace, and that you won't be upset easily. Can you say amen? Oh, sure. Have you ever been to a family gathering and something's brought up that created divisional thoughts? That's when you head to the bathroom, you start praying. <laughs> so that's how it, Satan gets his energy. So let's look at this scenario and this will be a blessing to you. And that is, so you got a new job. Everybody on the, in the job's got to be lifted up in prayer now because they're a potential enemy of yours because you love God and they are not saved. So you would be ignorant not to pray for that whole scenario. Now, uh, many times I've been a, an employee, but a lot, most of the time I've been a, a boss. And that's what God taught me. You pray over every situation you're involved in so the enemy can't go in and create division. Say amen. amen. And so he fills us full of love so we can head the enemy off at the pass. Before he even gets there, we can pick him off because God, don't you believe, God is far smarter and far more ahead of the enemy than he could ever think. And who lives in you and I? So, hey, smarty. Don't let that enemy go in and confuse your thinking. Listen to yourself once in a while. I wish we could carry a tape recorder on the side. And they ask people, and out of their heart comes criticism, and putting things down, and complaining about this. And yet, we pray for revival. Now, I'm not faulting us. I just want us to get to know ourselves. Amen. We need that exposure to God to make us worth our worth. All right. New creation realities. Glory to God. Our scripture for the week. Is it up there? And yeah, don't take it down. Just leave it there. The message for the week is Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Do you know what that means? That means you don't talk like the world. You don't speak like the world. You don't cuss like the world. You don't get your information and your counseling from the world. Because the world is passing away. Can you say amen? Eyes off the world, right? <laughs> so... Under God, nor stands in the path of sinners. Most people in the King James don't understand that. To stand in the path of sinners doesn't mean you keep sinners from getting saved. It means that you're acting just like them and people can't tell you from the world. It kind of shoots down seeking churches, doesn't it? We're not to look like or smell like the world. Smell good, look good. But <laughs> can you say amen? Amen nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Don't become a critic. Don't sit back in your easy chair and criticize everything that you don't like. Everyone say, I got that. The worst thing you can do as a Christian is become critical about anything. Think about it. God doesn't rail on the enemy. He just tells the enemy to get lost. 
Hello. So being critical can really open a door for the enemy to hinder you. Now, these are hindrances. So you don't walk like the world. You don't stand in the path of sinners, sit around at the water tank and tell dirty jokes, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Don't scorn things. But his delight, everyone say delight, is in the law or principle of the Lord. And in his law or principle, he meditates day and night. Next scripture, please. He shall be like a tree. Isaiah 66 says, your trees are righteousness. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that it brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. That's you. So as Christians, we get on with God. We don't get on to criticize the world. And this is what Satan did. He brought in a wonderful man of God to be our leader. And a bunch of corrupted people removed him. What that created is turmoil in the entire United States. It made opposition. One kind has this kind, and the other kind has that kind, and neither the twain can get together. Satan's trick. Listen, the Bible says pray for your leaders, pray for those in authority, and keep your hands off of them. Let God deal with them. So folks, over every nation, over every tribe, over every particular let's, county, state, there's demon presence and there's godly presence. Godly presence goes by us speaking the word in the earth, asking God to get involved. Evil presence is finding any Yehu that will listen to his suggestions so he can corrupt them and cause problems for you and I. Folks, at the end of it all, we get this earth. They do not. So make ready. Make ready. We got the rest of eternity to live with God. We got victory right now. Don't wait. Oh, we got to have some pie in the sky. In the pie and by. No, I want some steak on my plate while I wait. And I can get that through the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So good morning to you, everybody. Good morning. There we go. Good morning, Pastor. I could just imagine that. <laughs> Bless your heart. You see, one time we were enemies of the, of the faith, but then we surrendered and accepted Jesus Christ. Now God wants us filled as vessels of honor. He wants us filled with, a, with him so we can take him into all the world and share him with every person and every creature. Can you say amen? That's the great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And lo, I am with you always. That's why Jesus never liked to fly. Lo, I'm with you always. Moving right along. Now, we are vessels and containers. Our God wants us filled and clothed with his power. Now, see, there's a difference. Now, catch me on this. I'm going to share some things maybe you haven't heard. We're, God wants us filled, but he also wants us clothed. A filling is on the inside. A clothing is on the outside. Amen. So we're going to look at a couple of scriptures that talk about this very thing and the difference between filling and clothing. Okay. So let's go ahead and look a little bit more things. Go with me to second Timothy chapter two. Bless you guys today. I'm excited. The word's good. Amen. So God wants us filled and clothed with his power. To do what we must do for him. Being filled with the spirit means it's for your daily walk. And through your daily walk, there's drainings and things that happen. So you stop periodically, you begin to worship it and get filled right back up. You keep your batteries and your vessel topped off. Can you say amen? You know, if you're any kind of mechanic, you know that if a car sits for a long time, with a quarter of a tank, the, the tank's going to fill up with some water because of condensation. What happens if you're not a person of prayer daily, you're going to fill up with something and it won't be condensation. 
because the enemy will try to put lace your mind and the way you do things or maybe your sister will call you haven't heard for a long time and chew you out and these little differences come out of the blue you know who that really is because we can line everything up with every good and perfect gift if it's not good if it's not perfect then we know it doesn't come from the father of lights it means it somehow got skewed with a little bit of coffee mixed in with it hello that's Satan's job is to skew our thinking, to make us ineffective, to not know where we're going, to not understand the steps that God lays out for us, but not you. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21 says this, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and day, excuse me, and clay. Some to honor, some to dishonor. Therefore, or because of this, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of what? A vessel of honor, sanctified, set apart, and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. See, that's you. That's who you are. You're a vessel of honor. Amen. So here's a couple of points. Number one, the great house there is where people gather. How many know we gather in a house? Kind of a building. But all over the world, Christians are gathering. Can you say amen? In Africa, in Israel, all kinds are gathering. But in that gathering, it's called a house, a house of the Lord. In that gathering, there are people that are serious and submitted to God, vessels of honor. And there are people who are not serious, they're carnal, and they just seem to look and smell like the world, those are vessels of dishonor. They're in the same house. So there are Christians that obey, and there are Christians that disobey. Which one do you think is honored? So look at your neighbor and say, obey or else. <laughs> Well, I got to get you to laugh because it's really all about doing what God says. You see, if I hear what God wants and I practice and study what God wants and I will do what God asked me to do, I will become what God is doing. It's no longer me doing it, but God empowering me to do it. I'm a vessel of honor. You need to get up and see yourself as a vessel of honor. See yourself meeting with God, getting filled. So no little polywogs can get in your brain. Can you say amen? Because you know how strong you are when you're by yourself thinking of, oh, poor me. Moving right along. So the great house there are the gatherings of believers all over the world. And the curious. You know, people come to church sometimes because they're just curious. But remember, the main reason people don't go to church is because they never were asked by somebody who does go to church, who never said, I'll meet you at the front door. So you don't feel estranged. Where is your ability to evangelize, folks? Are you too old for that? Bring people to church. Say amen. Second of all, God desires all of us to bring honor to him. And we really do this. He empowers us to stay plugged in and full of his power. Say, I'm full of it. You know what he's talking about. Amen. Here's a note for you. In this note, I'm going to tell you, there are certain things that Christians must do. You can't be just sitting around for God to do everything for you. He'll do most. But remember this. He asks you to do it, will empower you to do it, but you can't do with his power he will do for you. So if you can't do something and he's asked you to do it, don't worry about it because he'll empower you to get her done. I have a t-shirt that I wear from the cable guy. It says, get her done. <laughs> Amen. But it's God in us that does the work. It's not us ourselves. I don't want any credit. In fact, I love giving God all the credit. One time I was giving God credit for my old beat up car. And he says, son, I don't want your car. <laughs> no, we didn't. He says, okay, I'll make it run. Amen. And now I'm looking forward to give that car away to 
whoever God tells me to give it to. And I'm just excited about it. Because as you sow, so shall you reap. All right. So a couple of things that we need to do. Number one, we were beings clothed in light. Remember in the original, I taught you that before Adam and Eve sinned, they were clothed in light. God is light and in him is no. So if God is light and we're made in his image after his likeness, then we are clothed in light. What does Satan not like? Yeah. So don't leave your clothing somewhere else and run around in the flesh. Oh, get that God clothing on. Can you say amen? I'm joking with you. Moving right along. Okay, so listen. Here's what happened. We fell in Adam. Adam's genes and DNA was passed on to every man, Romans 5. So we all died in Adam. We became not a like creature anymore, but a sense-ruled creature, ruled by our five physical senses. So the light was gone. What repels the devil? Light. And if the light's gone, your flesh isn't going to do anything but try to figure out what the devil's doing. No, no. You see, when we get born again, God clothes us again with his light. So he puts us back in the position we once had in him and even further. See, Adam, I'm going to say this. This is a good thing. Make a note of this. Every time you see the word God, like, for example, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God there is the word Elohim. Everyone say Elohim. It means direct connection or of being God. So God is Elohim. All the angels he created, they're called Elohim. Adam and Eve were not born. They were they were direct creations from God, so they're also an Elohim. Um, when we do our special studies, I'll take you to Psalms 82, where God stands in the congregation, where Elohim stands in the congregation of the Elohim. What's he talking about, Pastor Gary? He's saying every original creation that God made originally came from here, wasn't born in the earth, came from him. All are a part of the Elohim. That's what Moses saw on the mountain when he looked at the burning bush. The consuming fire of God, all parts working with him. Now we know Satan fell, didn't he? And with that, he took one third of all the angels. So they become fallen Elohim. Fallen Elohim. Ben and a Elohim. Something like I, I want to make sure I get the right. I'm trying to see it in my mind. Ben and a Elohim. It means the fallen ones. So, guess what? Lucifer. Now, here's another thing. How many here know that some of the angels are different than some of the other angels? Here, I'll blow your mind. The seraphim. The term seraphim means a fiery serpent angel. Did you know that? The seraphim that are over the, the, they're a fiery serpent angel. What did God put in the garden after Adam and Eve sinned to keep the garden and the tree of life? A cherubim, a fiery serpent with a fiery sword. Now you know what Satan was. He says, you were a cherubim, full of beauty. You were in the mountain of God. So he was a fiery serpent that fell. So when we see him in the garden, does he come in on a serpent or does he walk in as a fiery serpent? Now you're getting the pictures of, of how religion is clouded up some of our understanding. Satan doesn't come in riding on a serpent. He was a serpent, a cherubim. That means he's a plume serpent. And that means very beautiful, about seven foot tall or more. And he, he's qu quite in direct opposition to God. He's absolutely beautiful. So it has to capture man's imagination. So those are some of the things I threw in, no extra charge. So everything that came direct from God is Elohim, part of God. Everything that was created afterwards, like Adam and Eve didn't have a belly button, but you and I do. We are born of the earth. 
So we're not Elohim. We're, we're like God. Made in his image after his likeness. So see, I got it. No extra charge for all that good stuff, okay? That just kind of sets you up to learn. Okay, so how many angels fell with Lucifer? One third. Leaves how many? All right, so remember there are more with us than there are with him. He's just aggressive, he's a liar, and he's deceptive. So it seems like he's winning everything, but he's not. If you don't stick your head out of the car and get hit by a sign... Hello? Stay in Christ. Don't reward yourself with fleshly things. Stay in Christ. God, you're going to make me a cocktail of Holy Ghost and fire. <laughs> Don't dump it out of a bottle. Anyway, moving along. So, we are being clothed with light. Adam changed all of that, but Christ we put on Christ, don't we? So he is light. So if we put on Christ, then we put on the armor of light. Yeah. Romans 13. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, we are beings of light. That's why Satan, when you meet with God, let God clothe you, fix you, adjust you for the day. You come out of your prayer closet. You look like Jesus. You smell like Jesus. And if you don't open your mouth and talk your head, you'll talk like Jesus. Huh? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen. How is it that we will bless God with our lips and curse man who are making the image of God? These things shouldn't be, James tells us. Going on further, look at, listen to this. We are to be filled with the Spirit. We are to be clothed with His power. Can you say amen? amen? Being filled is for everyday life. Being clothed in power is for ministering and warfare for souls and for people to be healed. Hello. God doesn't want us to have an infirmity. Where it says, though, I am weak, he is strong. That doesn't mean run around, be infirm all the time, so God is strong. That means let God heal what you have that is infirm so the testimony will bring strength. God healed me of this. God healed me of that. God healed me. I'm an open sponge. I just want everything God asked for me. Be that way. And if you can't be that way, ask God to help you to become that way. Remember, God's your helper. He will send you another comforter, another helper. I will not leave you orphans. I won't leave you alone. I will come to you. But you've got to ask. I'm tired of asking. I've been asking for years. Don't stop. Now, what, when people ask, you're supposed to believe you receive, right? But here's what people do. They'll, they'll ask. They'll believe they got it. And then something will get up and Satan will send somebody to ask them. Well, how did your prayer time go? Well, it went really good. Do you really think you got what you asked? And they'll start throwing in doubt. Who's doing that? They don't know they're being used. Do you know there's a lot of people being used to the enemy that don't know they're being used to the enemy? You can discern it because if it's not good and perfect, you know it's a mixed up mess or a mixed up bunch of suggestions or a bunch of counseling. No, I want to hear from God. Can you say amen? All right, we are to be filled, clothed with power. Being filled is for everyday life, being clothed with power. Acts 10, 38, let me quote it for you. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Amen. So God wants you well, whole, happy, excited. Can you say Amen. All right, go with me to Luke chapter 24, please. Being filled and clothed. I can think about Ephesians. Yeah, yeah. Go with me. Yeah. Luke 24. <clears throat> I can think of Ephesians 5.18, which says, Be not drunk with wine where in excess, but be as being filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, 
hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. This is the will of God for us to be that way. If you keep the water stirred, nobody's going to put polywalks in on you. If you keep your mind focused on God with God's help, nobody's going to lay any, oh, you should have, you could have, you would have, stuff on you. We already talked about how oftentimes you will hear your voice say something that you know it didn't come from you. Who do you think that was? So you discern your thoughts. The closer you get to God, the more the enemy's going to try suggesting negatives to you. He can't come to you personally because you're clothed in light. But he'll throw suggestions at you, dealing with your past. See, remember when you did this? Remember when you were on the drugs and all that kind of stuff? Who do you think you are? And if we dwell on that, it will literally dim the light and our flesh will start to rise up and Satan will go, oh, that's Carrie. And then Jesus, I know how Carrie thinks. See, since you were very, very young, God had, an, had angels assigned to you and also Satan had evil assigned to you. Hopefully, by the time you get to the age of knowing right from wrong, Satan's hoping that he can share enough negative things and enough bad situations that he'll bring them up when the time is needed when you find Christ. You go, Brian, remember? Huh? And then he'll bring up sister so-and-so. Who knows, Brian? <laughs> Listen, yesterday's gone, brother. I, I remember, this is going to be, you can laugh. I remember hearing so many rumors about me when I had my problems back when I was a minister and, and all the, I can't, it'd take me months to tell you everything. One thing I will tell you, nobody ever came to me and asked me my side of the story. To me, that's really not right. I went to my friends' churches, many of them helped get their churches started, and they literally told me to get lost. So here I'm seeking to be restored, and they're telling me, we don't want you around here. This will never happen here. This will never happen here. There's plenty of wounded soldiers out there, and all they need is love, and they need to be known that they can be restored. I'm one of those people. And I don't, I don't mind. Yes, I made great mistakes, but who amongst us hasn't? You without sin cast the first stone. And yet we got a body out there. All they can do is throw things at one another and argue over the whether we meet on a Saturday or a Sunday. And you can see Satan's tricks and why the church is so powerless. We're not powerless here. Somebody's being healed in, in their gut. I don't know if it's, well, I don't want to mention it. It's Crohn's disease or something like that being healed. You're being healed right now. You can feel a warmth in there and stuff. You don't have to shout or anything. Come up here and dance around. I've had that happen too. But somebody, you're female, you're getting healed right at this moment. So you keep receiving. Lord, I keep receiving. That's me. I receive that. Lord, that's me. And you do that. It doesn't matter where you're at. God knows every one of us. There's not a hair that falls out of our head he does not wear up. Right? Man, I want a guy like that in my heart. You got it. All right, Luke 24, verse 36. As, behold, I send the promise of my Father. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, go to Jerusalem. I send the promise of my Father, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endowed with power from on high. The word endowed is an old transliteration, which means clothed and zapped. Everyone say zapped. Yeah. When you receive Jesus, you get zapped with eternal life. Well, I didn't feel like I got zapped. Oh, I did. Doesn't mean we don't care how you feel when you get saved. We just know you believe, you confess, you're saved. But he said to his disciples, you want to do the things that I'm doing? I need you to go to Jerusalem and wait until the Holy Spirit's poured out. We know the kingdom and the Holy Spirit came at what day? Pentecost. The kingdom came and the power of God came and it's in all the air that you breathe. 
It's also if you're born again in your heart. So everyone, let's do a little experiment. Those of you in camera, close your eyes. Remember, God is in the air. Okay? Take a big breath of Jesus. Go ahead, say Jesus, and take a big breath. And then hold it, and then breathe out slowly, Jesus. Do that about three times and tell me exactly how you feel. Do it. Come on. Jesus. You feel it? You sense the Holy Spirit gathering? He loves that, see? You're focusing in on him. And when you do that, you tap in. If you want water in your sink, you got to tap it. Turn on the nozzle. That's what we're doing. Is you're learning to turn on the nozzle at will for God's presence to come. Well, God, there's a real devil sitting over there. I please... Can you put the armor on me and make me strong so I can deal with them? That's where a lot of the Christians are. Come on. You met with God. You already have the armor on. You're glistening full of Jesus. Unless you open your mouth and speak contrary. <laughs> so just keep yourself quiet. How many know that Holy Spirit can teach you not to say something when normally you would have and you've gotten in trouble? So he can withhold our words, which is good. He can give us words to say, which is good. But if it's not God in it, don't be playing around. Do you need my attention? Okay, all right. So, wait to the promise of the Father. So we know in Acts chapter 2, go with me there, verses 1 through 4. Just listen to it. It's good. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind and it filled the whole house to which they were sitting. Now here's something you don't know. Not only did it fill the whole house where they were sitting, it filled the whole atmosphere of the earth. And the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see? But we only have access to the Spirit through Christ. Through Christ. Not by Christ, through Christ. So when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, you have access right there. Okay? Kingdom of God's opened up to you. Heaven's opened up to you. Now what are you going to say? Gosh, I hope God's listening. <laughs> Hello? Come on, laugh at yourself a little. You are a child of the Most High God. You didn't make yourself that way. God made you that way. Now wear his clothes. Stop wearing pauper's clothes. Stop talking like a pauper. I don't know what God's going to do. Pauper, stop it. Talk right. Believe right. That doesn't mean you're, you're not going to be tempted. The enemy's not going to try to make you sick or something. That's not it. What that does is it completely puts you in a position where God has freedom to minister to our hearts any day, any time, day or night. Listen to this, Acts 1.8. You know this one. And you shall receive power. That's the Greek word dunamis, which means inherent power to produce Jesus Christ and his miracles. Now, does Satan have that power? No, he's only got the ability to deceive. And look what it says. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is what? What's it say? Comes upon you. Is that outwardly or inwardly? Outwardly. Hello? And then the Holy Spirit also fills us. So we're getting it from all ends. Can you say amen? Why is it then sometimes we go through all of this junk because you're not quite together of how to wear the armor right. You forgot the helmet back at home. <laughs> now listen to this. Okay, and this says you receive power for one reason. 
to be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Puyallup, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. I threw Puyallup in. Then in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, says this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord, one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared on all of them divided tongues as of fire. One sat on each of them, and they were all filled. See the word filled there? Clothed and filled. Clothed and filled. Clothed and filled. Filled and clothed. Clothed and filled. Did you forget your clothing today? Hello? For there appeared unto them diverse tongues of fire, and it sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I'm a tongue talker, okay? But I don't do it foolishly. Here's what God showed me. When did God give you your spiritual language? Now, stop. Don't be so such a hurry. When did God give you your spiritual language? When you were born. You see, when you're born first, you're born alive to God. You're born into a sin factory, but you're alive to God because God doesn't have dead spirits, Brian. He doesn't have a dead soul to give you. So your spirit is part of him he puts in you. comes directly from God. So that part of you is an Elohim piece, aren't you? But the part's born is the flesh. So we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a, a body. Amen. And so in understanding those very things, we need to understand that the power comes out from our inside. We walk from the inside out, not from the analytical part in. Don't analyze things. Pray. So God gives you wisdom to know what to do at the time you need to do it. Say amen. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Now, here's where your language comes. When you were a little infant in your mom's womb, you had a spiritual language. And when you were born a little baby, that language started to come out. Sorry, I'm being like a little kid. And mom seems to know what the child wants. But the child's not old enough to articulate in, an, in, their own, in a known language. So his spirit, or her spirit, is in direct communication with God till they get the age of knowing right and wrong or how to sass mama. So when they get to the, how to sassy and how the rebellion starts, they need to become born again. My two children, Wendy, and my, my son, Michael, each one, when they reached the age five to six, Spirit of God moved them. They came up front, gave their heart to the Lord. Now, I'm not saying any particular age is the right age. I'm just saying when a child knows to choose right from wrong and chooses wrong, the spirit separates from God, has to become born again. Well, God gave that language in our hearts before we were born. And when we were born, till we got to the age of accountability, then the spiritual end separated unless you de were dedicated to the Lord or dedicated yourself. My, my son, he dedicated himself, got spirit filled. My daughter, she dedicated herself to the Lord. And my ushers at that time had a huge church, about 500 plus. And my kids started walking towards the altar and the ushers come on glued and run up there and stop my kids. Oh, they're, they're getting out of line. They're coming up to the altar. I said, leave them alone. They're coming to receive Jesus. And so the language of another tongue, a spiritual tongue, was given to you when God thought of you. Put it in your spirit. It's there. So we get to the age of accountability, and then we get born again. That language is relit in your heart, but must be yielded to. You must learn how to yield to it because you're just not going to babble. It has great meaning. And we'll bring it up a little later on. But that language is something that we need to have released because that's the one language that you have talks to God without you getting in the way. Come on, look at me that way. God needs you out of the way a lot of the time so he can get done what he needs to do for you. But we want to help. 
We want to block all the kitchen, get everybody who's in the kitchen helping out, you know, can't get a thing done. I want to be in the kitchen by myself, maybe a helper, but I, I'm the kind of person that I, I focus on what I, but anyway, you can see many hands sometimes can get in the way. Amen. So what I want to say to you is, your language is something all of you have. Whether you yield to it or not, it's up to you. God wants you all to speak with tongues. Paul said, I wish you all spoke in tongues more than me. You see, so the tongue language bypasses you, bypasses the devil, bypasses everything but God. Covers everything in a split second compared to English words. So you might ask God, if you haven't got your language, to show you about it. I'll teach you a little more about it and we'll get you prayed through and develop that language for you. But don't treat it as it's the devil. Remember, the sin, when people that blame God for being the devil is a blasphemy. It says all blasphemy will be forgiven except for the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And most people go, what's that, Pastor Kerry? Never getting born again. Because to blaspheme means to repel. So if I hand a gift to Seth and he doesn't want that gift, he's going to say, I don't want it. I don't want it. That's a form of repelling or blasphemy. Now he's not blaspheming all that. So if God wants to give us something but we refuse, that's a form of blasphemy. Now listen, let's say you believe as a Christian, you believe in salvation, but you don't believe in healing. That's a form of blasphemy. Now, you're not going to go to hell for that. You're just not going to experience the positive end of that because you don't think it's of God. So to blasphemy means to think what is God giving you grace, you repel it and never get born again. That's the unpardonable sin because unless you be forgiven. How many here know we can be forgiven of all sin? Why is blasphemy such a big thing? Because who delivers Jesus to you? The Holy Spirit. And if you push him away, can you get Jesus? If God wants to give you healing and you think, well, I'm unworthy. I don't know why God wants to do that for me. It's a form of repelling. Now, everyone take the word blasphemy out of there. We've heard that so negatively. It simply means a a refusal of what God wants to offer you. Okay? So you're not such a bad person. (laughs) Hello? So say, Lord, I don't want to refuse anything you have for me. Right? Because he doesn't have anything bad. Do you think God has placed you in the United States so you can experience COVID? (laughs) Why do we blame God for such foolish things? Anyway, did you get that? Say, I got it. So you all have your language. It's just whether it's manifested or not, it's up to you. And if you want that, we'll get you taken care of. Even today. It's no big deal. I've prayed for hundreds of people at a time. All of them getting filled with the Spirit. It's the most amazing thing. It's just like being born again, except for you step in more. Okay, say amen. So we're to be filled and what? Clothed. We're to be clothed and? Amen. We're to be filled and? And who does the clothing? God. Who does the filling? God. So who do you need to meet with? God. God. Very good. You guys are wonderful. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. (laughs) So you say, well, I don't know. I've never heard a talk where we got our language ahead of time. No. Because most people don't have that insight. Now, how many know that God's perfect? And when he created you, did he create you perfect? But when you were born, you were, crea- you were imperfect. But your spirit was perfect, and your soul was perfect. But your flesh is corrupted. Right? Stays good for a while, but then goes into the trash bin. <laughs> Amen! Now, let me ask you this question. Do you trust yourself? Moving right along. (laughs) A couple of points I want to give you. Power from God to them to be witnesses. You shall receive power 
from God to be a witness of me. What is a witness? Your life is being observed. If you're a parent, your kids need to see you changed. They need to see that you don't do the same old bad things over and over again because you have God in you. And he stops that eventually. Now you'll get away with a few things, you think. But as you continue to walk with him, he cleans you up and he keeps you from repeating nasty old bad habits. Say amen. So if you're still lying and you got saved 40 years ago, you might want to check to see if you're really in fellowship with God, moving around along. So we're a chosen vessel, not a crock pot. We had some of those last week. I think we have some this week. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 3. Listen. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Paul is in jail, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling to which you were called with all lowliness, not uppityness, lowliness and gentleness with long suffering. Why? Bearing with one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. A couple of points underneath that. God has empowered you and I for the task that he assigns us. He's never going to ask us to do something that he's not going to help us do. We are to walk worthy of the call. The call is heavenly. Amen. So don't go out there and give up your salvation or do something dumb. And, so, and in your next phrase is, Lord, help me. Amen. Two, with all loneliness, gentleness, and long suffering, that's how we should dwell with one another. If you're a leader, don't lead by forcing people. Don't throw condemnation on people and say, it's because your life is not together, you're going through this. We don't have any right to do that. Only God. Hello. Our job is to love one another, to stand with them in prayer, help encourage them to overcome, but not to become their critic nor their judge. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Colossians 1, 9 and 10 says this. Listen, I do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And that ye may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Say amen, somebody. So we are the chosen vessel to give God glory. My next point is keep yourself in check. Don't write me a big check, but keep yourself in check if you want power. See, we're containers, we're vessels. And you're to be filled with God's power. Say amen. And that you can contain that whole power throughout the entire day until the enemy gets you all upset, gets you in a position to start leaking and cracking your pot. You have a clay pot called your flesh. And you have to present it to God so he fixes all cracks that we end up getting throughout the day. Oh, what do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, bad talking, holding anger, speaking. Hey, did you hear about Brother Dave? Just joking. You see what I'm saying? Crack, crack, crack. And here's something about the cracks. The water will leak out to where the edge of the crack is. So if your crack is a bad confession, until you get that fixed, as soon as you get filled, it's going to drain out on the way in the parking lot. And you're going to have a little remainder in there because of your big mouth. Everybody look at me and see, we love Pastor Kerry. Satan will give you all kinds of opportunities just to criticize me or criticize others. Avoid it because it cracks your pot and causes the power to drain out. You have two poles on your battery. Both are needed to function and make the car work. Hello. But if you cross them, you'll become powerless. And so if your flesh crosses God's work in your spirit and you let them throughout the day cross each other, you will short out the power of God. Remember Jesus' disciples? They, he told them, laid hands on them, says, go out and cast out devils, lay hands on the sick, you know, pray for the lepers, you know, 
And they went out and started doing that. But then he came to this boy who had a spirit that threw him down in the fire and into the water. And they couldn't cast the spirit out. So they went to Jesus and they said, Jesus, why could not we cast the spirit out? And Jesus said, this time comes forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Then he turned to the boy and cast out the spirit. Now, do you know what he was saying there? He's saying, you've got to make sure you've got your crack pot in check because you meet with God every day. You're in check. You're in good. Because if you don't, you'll become powerless at the end of the day and you'll have to stop and pray. Don't go ahead and stop and pray. Every time you feel powerless, stop and pray. It only takes about a moment to get plugged back in. Hello. If you've ever vacuumed, we have a wonderful little vacuum. But if you're not careful and don't wrap the, the cord up around the vacuum and then seal it there, people can step on the cord and while they're vacuuming, rip it right out of the deal. Yeah. I've done it. Hello. You've got to operate within the principles of the machine or the kingdom or whatever set up, not doing it your own way, thinking God's going to bless you. Because when you do it your way, you're in rebellion. So we don't think about it that way. If God asks you to be nice and you're crabby, you're in rebellion. Simply. So nothing's going to work for you until you find the Lord and talk to him and get it under the blood. Say amen, somebody. Now listen to Mark chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else a new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is worse than the, the cloth itself. Do you understand that? He's talking about Old and New Testament anointings. The cloth on the old garment is the Old Testament anointing. When the anointing came on the Old Testament believers, it came upon them. And it pulls them towards God, pulls them towards doing the work of God, like Samson. But when Samson wasn't under the anointing, he got delilah <laughs> So you watch out. If you have a position of authority, you have money, you have talent, Satan wants you. And he's going to start corrupting that area. But thank God you don't listen to that, do you? So in the Old Testament... God would sew on this new anointed piece of garment from his garment and it would cause them to do all these good works but then they would, it would pull away from the sinfulness of the Old Testament believer because an Old Testament believer, believer is different than a New Testament believer in how so? They weren't born again. We are born again. They didn't have God in them. We have God in us. So when the anointing came on them, it had to pull away eventually because they were sinners. They weren't born again in the Old Testament. That's why the ground opened up and swallowed many of them because they did against God. Anyway, we'll go to that and another thing. I can't wait till some of you invite me home and hit me with 120 questions. Go right down the line. Let's go through some of this stuff. I'm waiting for you to get serious. Can you say me? I'm true. <laughs> we have to. These are the last days, folks. You want to hang outside the car again? Get it by the sign. <laughs> Jimmy, bring your hands in the car. I used to hang out of the car when I was younger. You know, I'd be hanging out of the car and almost fall out through the window. All right, so let's look at this. Okay, keep yourself in check. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 3, 4, and 5. Are you with me? I'm trying to hurry up, guys. All right. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 3 through 6. For this is the will of God and your being set apart, sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality and that each of you should know how to possess, now listen, his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Say, I need to learn to control myself. Say that. I need to learn with God's help to control myself. How many know when you're out of control, we can often say things we don't really should? Not me, Pastor Kerry. I'm above all that. All right. In the same, 
Let's drop down a little further. Look at verse 7. I read, did I read the first part of that? Huh? Okay. For this cause, or for this is the will of God in your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, having sex outside of marriage, and with yourself. These are cautionaries. God's not going to throw you away if you're, you're struggling with that. But if you continue on, it can cause some demonization. We don't want that. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor and not in passion of lusts as like the Gentiles who know not God. Then he goes on further, verse 7, 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but rejects who has given us the Holy Spirit. See, there's your blasphemy right there. You keep rejecting the Holy Spirit, giving you forgiveness and giving you insight, and then you're going to stay the carnal Christian you always were. We don't want you that way. All right, go with me to Ecclesiastics. We'll finish with this scripture. Ecclesiastics chapter 5. You're a spiritual being, so we follow God from our spirit. We must place our body on the altar in a daily situation before God. And the biggest cracking that we have in our vessel of honor is our big mouth. Okay? It, it is. We do things and say things we wish it could pull right on back. You can't. All right. You about ready? Okay. And there are other things which drain the power unforgiveness, gossip, but it all re relates to your mouth because it's not what goes in a man. Can you quote the scripture with me? It's not what goes in a man that defileth the man. It's what comes out of a man that defileth him. What he's saying is, it's not you eating food that you're wondering about or you taking certain elements in that make you anything bad. But after you've injected this stuff into you, what comes out of your mouth is what is bad. So if you drink too much, you're liable to say a few things you didn't mean. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth slippeth. Come on, are you with me? And so we need to keep ourselves in a, in a check. We need to know. Folks, we have a, we have a little... I don't know, it's not a regulation, but a rule here. All of your domestic problems, you should go to God first with. Don't bring to the church and tell everybody you're going through such a hard time. That is not what the church is for. The church is for training you, getting you to offer praise and worship, and to sit at the feet of Jesus. It's not for you to bring your garbage in and throw it amongst the congregation. So our domestic problems, you go to your one-on-one -on -one with a pastor or, or something, you don't come into the congregation and make a discussion around the water thing. <laughs> Have you, you know anybody that in a matter of moments they speak everything they know? And so you love them and you pray for them so that they'll not do that because we know we crack our effectiveness by our words of our mouth, death and life are in the tongue. Are you with me? So let's read Ecclesiastics 5. Walk prudently. The word is uprightly. Walk uprightly or prudently when you go into the house of God. Here we go. <laughs> All right. And draw near to listen rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. What is a sacrifice of fools? Always talking. When you come into the house of God, be ready to listen. Don't be ready to tell everybody what you're doing and all that kind of stuff. That's not what it's for. Are you, are you getting this? Well, I thought the church was to pray for that. Well, yes. But you're supposed to be able to go to God first and unload. Can you say amen? If you have a bus and you're going to pick up 10 people, but you got a bunch of stuff in the bus, you got to unload the bus. So you get the people in. 
you, if you're having a bad morning, unload the bus. Fill it with God so you can get the benefits. Say amen. Come on, everybody smile at me. Say, we love you, pastor. Oh, yes, we do. We love you, pastor. It's true. <laughs> you got to realize I'm having, because of God, the time of my life doing what I want to do up until the time I go home to be with Jesus. And you will have the same thing. You might not be a, a ministry behind a pulpit, but you have very important assignment from God. Find out what they are and get after it. I must be about my father's business. And now listen to the rest of it. Walk uprightly properly when you go into the house of God. Draw near to hear rather than to speak the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they do evil. <coughs> Sorry about that. Then it goes on. Do not be rash with your mouth. Ooh, ooh. And let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. Anybody here not know what hasty means? Quick, just, just say something before you think. For God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be what? Let your words be. Here's the way you do it. We have two and one. Twice as much listening than you have to share your insight. Listen, I know you got good stuff. But if you have to share it and can't wait for everybody else, you're out of line. God's a gentleman. So let's go on. Don't be rash with your mouth. Don't utter foolish things before God. For God will hold you to your word. For God is in heaven, you're on earth, therefore let your words be few. For a dream, listen, comes through much activity and a fool's voice is known by many words. Now, I didn't write that. I don't think you're that way. But we all know people will come in damaged into a church like that. And then if you're mature in the Lord, your job is to sit with them, pray with them so that they, they don't bring any damaging goods and we can see that God heals them up, right? And when we're praying in the circle, I love for some of you come a little early and pray in the circle for the, for the uh, church service. We did that one day and a guy came in and f filmed all of what was going on in our churches, my other church, and he filmed everybody up there praying and you could see the Holy Spirit hovering over everybody. I got a picture of it in the picture, without doctoring. And that's what God, we want to draw God in. We want be such in unity with God, God feels at home with us. Well, if you got something out of this morning, we give the Lord a hand. Thank you for letting me keep you long.